now let's move over very fastly <laughs> to the next technical keynote. Um, this is a keynote about um, an infrastructure project at Amadeus. Uh, Amadeus is, I think, the one company who rules everything travel, right, in Europe, at least, yeah. It is unbelievable what they're doing. Um, our keynote speaker, <laughs> we were just chatting, he's a French, speaking English, working here in Bavaria, <laughs> and he's vice president of the techn technology platform engineering at Amadeus. Please welcome Sylvain Roy. Thank you very much. True. Okay. And it works. Hello, everyone. So, Amadeus, a year and a half ago, decided to go to the public cloud. Uh, kind of a major project. What Sebastian didn't say is that we've got our biggest data center, something like 20 kilometers from here, and we've got quite a few data centers all around the world. And a year and a half ago, we said, okay, we go public cloud. Okay, and I'd like to share a bit about that, um, the why. And also, what happened? And we're still in the middle of it, okay? So the story is not completed. But we already have some findings and quite a few things which are not the way we expected them to be. So I'd like to share a bit about it. But first, let me set the scene. So I said by Sebastian, yes, we are in, in, into travel, okay? We're an IT company, a fairly big IT company, not that known, uh, probably something like 60,000 people, um, half of them being developers. And we're all over the place when it comes to travel. Okay, usually people don't know Amadeus, but if you go to a travel agency, it's going to be Amadeus behind the scene. You go to an airline website, Amadeus behind the scene. You go to the airport to do your checking, it's going to be an Amadeus terminal. You do the boarding, Amadeus again. The flight balance, Amadeus again, and so on and so forth. So we're into airlines, health, hospitality, and, and so on. And we actually run a fairly big system. I think it's worth to say it. Um, I'm going to give a couple of numbers. I mean, number number one is maybe uh, the volume of transaction. It's a million transactions per second that we manage. 100,000 of those transactions are coming from, uh, from the external world. Okay, so it's uh, what we call the shopping traffic, mostly. Interestingly, if you put it in comparison, uh, Google search has 100,000 transactions per second, and we have 100,000 transactions per second. So a fairly big system in terms of traffic, and then you see the 30 petabyte of data, 30 petabyte of data, sorry, that we've got. Uh, we've got a fair amount of data as well in this migration. So that makes it a bit complicated. Uh, but then, I very much want to talk about the why, okay? And in a big company like that, when you talk about the public cloud, what's quite funny is that you will never get the same answer to the question, why are you moving there? What, what's the point? And I find that quite fun that people actually see it very differently, even in the same company, in the same project. My personal take of that is the one in the middle, which I need to explain maybe. Uh, as a company, we started on TPF, a mainframe system, you know, transaction processing facility. Those are IBM machines. Uh, that was 35 years uh, ago, OK? So quite, quite some time ago. We've done a major migration to move out of TPF to Unix, and then another migration to Linux, much smaller, obviously. Another one to go to a private cloud, and we made this private cloud an hybrid cloud, and now we're saying we go full public. And, and for me, there is a rationale here, which is you want to be where innovation happens, OK? And that's what we've done all along the way. Uh, if we were still on TPF, there wouldn't be any machine learning solution for us. No big data, okay? It all happens uh, in the cloud, and in particular in the public cloud. So that, for me, is the main reason to do this move, and the main reason we are moving today uh, to Azure, even though we're already using uh, Google and, uh, and AWS. Uh, but there are other reasons, okay? In the company, you will have people telling you, we're doing that because we want more agility, we want to be more efficient, and it's true that in the cloud, uh, you can probably get that, you will have uh, a better uh, tooling and a better system to do DevOps, DevSecOps, and, and so on. Some other people will tell you, and I'm one of them as well, it's a great opportunity to get to the next level in terms of security. And I will elaborate on that a bit later. Uh, it's a challenge, but it's also a great opportunity, and that's what we are doing. Um, cost control, let's call that um, uh, FinOps. On our side, the traffic has a strong seasonality. It happens for some reason, and we've never been able to explain that people tend to book their travel a lot, a lot in January. And then for the rest of the year, they're way quiet. We can't explain it, but every year in January, we've got to cope with much more traffic than what we will have in February and the rest of the year. Well, with the cloud, you've got this idea that you will be able to scale up and down and adjust your cost based on your traffic. And then, ooh, why does it disappear? Okay. And then, so there's a need for global footprint. I'm not a big fan of this one, but we're living in a world where it becomes a must to be able to deploy your software in various geographies, 
Okay? And today, everything is basically in a data center 20 kilometers from here. So those are for the big rational. Now let's go to what happens, okay, and the story. What I very much want to, let's say, give you a bit of value and to tell you what we've been through and what, you know, the things which uh, are not happening the way we expected to them to be. And the first one is about resiliency. Um, in fact, the real trigger for the move to the cloud, I didn't say that, is a few years ago in Bavaria, I wasn't there, uh, there's been a flooding, okay, and the water came basically that close to our data center. Really, really, really close. Uh, and even though we've got a great data center with multiple fire cells, multiple power line, multiple network access, and so on and so forth, at the end, when the water is that close to your fire cell, I mean, you are in a very critical situation. So we said never ever, uh, we want a disaster recovery. Okay, and the first idea of the disaster recovery at that time was, we're going to get a data center far enough from the one we have here in Munich, and we're going to basically duplicate the system in this new data center. We call it a disaster recovery. We replicate the data, and should, should something happen to the primary, we switch to the disaster recovery. The drawback of that is that basically you need to have the same capacity twice. Everything you've got in your primary, you need it in the disaster recovery. And that makes it crazy expensive extremely expensive. But the good news is the world is changing and now you've got something called the cloud and you've got public cloud providers out there and they've got data centers all over the world so let's just build your disaster recovery there. And that was the, the very naive initial idea, okay? Very naive because um, if you go with this assumption, you say, okay, my disaster recovery is gonna be somewhere in the cloud and the way something happened, the day something happened to my primary, I switch. I get all the machines from, uh, from those guys and I have my disaster recovery somewhere in the cloud. Well, no, no, why? Because uh, there is no cloud. You know, maybe no one told you, but there is no cloud. You're just running on the machine of someone else, okay? And if this someone else had something like 60,000 machines all ready for you uh, to activate your disaster recovery, they would have a very, very bad business case, okay? So, so I don't think they would be profitable. So obviously there is no cloud provider that will uh, have something like 60,000 virtual machines waiting for you to use them. So meaning you've got to allocate them. Oh, I don't know why it does that. Let me, yeah. So meaning you actually need to allocate those machines, but if you do that, you pay, okay? And then the business case is not there anymore. There is no point of doing that in the cloud. So maybe there is a way, and the way we found is to say, we're gonna spread our system across multiple regions. And that's what you can see on the, on, on the map on the right. We are spreading our system across five different regions in the US, and actually we will have more in, in, in the US and in Asia. Uh, and the idea here is, I mean, there are several ideas here, okay? Idea number one is, if we spread the system across multiple regions, uh, the day we will have to grow, okay? Uh, so our entire system is gonna be in the cloud. No more data center, we run in the cloud. So our primary is somehow based on five regions. So there's something happened to one of those regions, what do we do? Yeah, well, we still have four other regions where we can grow. And the growth that we need to achieve is in those four regions is obviously far smaller than what we would have to achieve in one region, okay? If we had just two regions, it basically means if this region collapse, all our critical system, we need to restand them in the, in the disaster recovery, and that means that we need to grow by something like 40% in terms of capacity. No cloud provider is ever gonna give you that, okay? If you're a small startup, it can work. If you have 60,000 VM, it's never gonna happen. So by doing that with four regions, it means that the growth, instead of being 40% in one region, is gonna be 10% in, in four regions, which makes it much more doable and much more acceptable for the cloud provider. That being said, they're never ever gonna commit on that, okay? You will not get Google, uh, Microsoft, or, or Amazon uh, to tell you it's okay, uh, we have the machines aside, and if you need to grow by 10%, I have them for you. It's never gonna happen, okay? So it's not enough, so we need to do more. And then what we've done is to say, some of our systems will have been identified as critical, we need them in case of disaster, some others are not. Test system, for example, it isn't. So we know that in case of disaster, what will happen is that we will stop part of our system, decrease the workload that we've got in the four region, move the workload that we have in the region which is in disaster to the other region, and somehow we should be able to cop, okay? And for the very, very critical system, last option, we actually pre-allocate the machine. We pay for it, we have the machines, and then we're guaranteed to have it, okay? And that we didn't see, okay? That's uh, this, uh, whoa, I have no idea why it does that. Um, that's it's something that we, I didn't, ooh, that is nice. Does it, my laptop, it looks way better than that. Let me unplug and replug. And it's coming back. 
So first finding, okay, building a data center at disaster recovery in the public cloud is not something which is that obvious. Uh, you need a bit more than just, you know, two regions. Second one, landing zone. That's another of those stories. We started, you know, a landing zone is basically in Azure. Uh, I mean, we call that a landing zone. I'm not too sure if it is a, a word used in the industry. But basically, a landing zone is uh, an Azure subscription, a subnet, and then we put everything we need in it to run an application. So a pass, okay, uh, we use OpenShift. Uh, we will have what it takes to do the logging, Splunk, we will have the artifactory of you, the names that are here are actually things that we deploy in a landing zone, okay? And if you think about it, our data center was basically two very big landing zones. One for test, one for prod. I simplify a bit, but that was a bit the world in which we are living. Moving to the public cloud, we said, okay, we're going to do that better, okay? Because we can do a bit more isolation and we probably want to do it. So in our mind, we were going to have, you know, a few landing zones, something like 10. We never put a number on it, but it was like, we will have a few more landing zones. But in fact, if you remember the previous slide, we, I said that we were going to be on five regions, plus two in the US, in fact. And it means that, uh, I mean, a landing zone is in one and only one region. So if you go across multiple regions, it basically means that you have to multiply the number of landing zones. So, you know, from a few landing zones, you start to multiply by five or sometimes even seven. And then, obviously, we want test and prod separately. Okay, so you multiply by two again. And then uh, we realize another thing, which is like, wow, 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 those landing zones, when we do things, we can actually break things. So maybe we want to make them a bit smaller in, you know, to have more resiliency. If something happens, the impact is not going to be that important. And frankly, Microsoft was also pushing us that way. And if there is something I've learned is that if your provider is uncomfortable with what you're doing, don't do it. Uh, they are not comfortable either. You're going to be on the edge of, of their use cases. You probably don't want to be there. So we said, okay, let's make the landing zone a bit smaller. And the outcome of that is that we ended up with, I mean, right now we are around 160 landing zones which is a lot, which is great, and which is a pain. It's great because it's a big enabler for DevOps. Now we can say to our DevOps teams, you have a landing zone. If they are advanced enough, if they are solid enough, we basically uh, delegate the management of the landing zone to, I'm going to come back to my laptop every minute to, yeah. So we delegate the landing zone to those guys, uh, which is great because we can really enable DevOps for that with a very clear scope. You have a DevOps teams, you have a set of applications and you have your own landing zone. That's a good part of it. Uh, there are two bad parts. Bad part number one, additional cost. If you've got plenty of landing zone, you need to deploy your middleware in plenty of landing zone. In terms of licenses, it has an impact. Okay? Bad part number two, there is no way you manage 160 landing zones manually. You need automation. So this automation that we've always dreamed about but never really implemented or never as well as we wanted, it becomes an absolute must. There is no way you manage 160 landing zones without automation. And the finding is, well, this automation is not easy. Uh, it's actually a much bigger piece of work than what we thought. You can see on the right side, basically, what we've put in place. Uh, it gives an idea, very high level, very simplified, of what we're putting in place. At the top, we've got ServiceNow, which is basically for the portal and the change management. You want to trigger a change, you go to ServiceNow, the change management, the validation of the change is going to happen there. You don't want to do the automation in ServiceNow. So below, we've put AWX, Ansible, so, uh, Ansible's playbook, to basically do the high-level automation of the whole thing. And then we're like, we want to go GitOps. We like GitOps, we like the declarative way of doing things, it's very solid. It helps a lot when you want to build a disaster recovery. So let's go for GitOps. So below uh, this uh, AWX layer, you've got a number of Git repositories. I put five. It's more like in the hundreds. Okay, it's a lot of uh, repositories that we've got there to store uh, basically the entire configuration. And below you've got the execution. And here again, we've got quite a few tools, basically plenty of Jenkins, obviously. Uh, we've got Terraform and TerraGrunt to organize TerraGrunt because that's what you need uh, when you go a bit far with, uh, with Terraform. Uh, we've got Argo CD when it comes to deploy things in OpenShift and more, okay? I didn't put all of them. And basically below, are, you've got all the interfaces that we orchestrate uh, with uh, Azure CLI and, um, and, uh, and Kubernetes, which is OpenShift in our cases. That took us, and I mean, it's still work ongoing. We're right now working on what we call day one automation, which is from zero to a fully operational landing zone. Uh, we're still working on that. It's a big amount of work. And then we have to, to do all the day two automation. You know, you want to change something in an existing landing zone. This isn't even started. So my finding on that is 
you know, you go to the cloud and you're like, everything is going to be there, it's going to be easy. No, you will need to do some automation if you go big. And the level autom of automation that we'll have to put in place is actually really important. And this project, which was like, we're going to migrate application, so far has been, we're building a platform to later on be able to migrate applications. So let me go to another aspect of it, uh, which is security. Um, so my perspective on the cloud when it comes to security is, uh, it's, it's a huge challenge and a great opportunity. A huge challenge because when you're in your own data center, you know, you've got what we call the bastion model. Uh, you secure the edge, firewall, whatever it takes, but when you're inside, you're at home and you feel safe, okay? In the public cloud, there is no walls. You're, there is no edge. You are in the public cloud. So obviously, you can't do things the same way and you've got to revisit the way you do security. Uh, but I think it's a great opportunity because, frankly, uh, we've been dying of doing all the work that you've got to do to be PCI DSS compliant, ISO something compliant. I mean, all those compliance issues, all the work that you've got to do to be actually secure is crazy big and is getting bigger and bigger. And somehow it's very difficult to do that in place. You know, you're in your data center, you're running the system, and you've got to change things to go to the next level in terms of security. Good luck with that. We've done that for years, and it is painfully slow. But here you've got a nice project where you're saying everything which is here in my data center, I'm going to move it, and I'm going to move it somewhere else in the public cloud. It gives you a great opportunity to do things differently. So we said, let's go for it. Let's, let's do change things and do it differently. And basically, uh, two things in here. First, we said, let's go for zero trust architecture. This model in which no application can talk to no other application. By default, something deployed in the cloud has no connectivity to anything else at all. Um, and the second thing that we said is we'll define eight big zones, macro zones, they're the ones that you can see on the left part of the screen, and that's the way our uh, system is going to be organized. And the way it works is basically you see the eight zones which are uh, on the edge, DMZ, CBZ, ANZ, and CRI. All those zones are basically zones in which you've got to um, you've got to go through those buffer zones uh, to go to the middle ones. Uh, so the middle ones are the ones where we've got our system. So the idea, I mean, the core of our system. So the idea, you're coming from the internet, internet connectivity is going to go through the DMZ buffer zone. And here the traffic, the message is going to be decoded, re-encoded, there will be something in there, meaning there is no direct connectivity through the DMZ. Okay? And the same thing for all the zones. Okay? So those buffer zones basically they protect the zones which are inside. It's difficult to go through it because the messages, the protocol is going to change along the way. Uh, and then in the middle zone, you've got this idea that we've got our application. So to give you an idea, APP is for application, that's where we put most of our workload. CD is the one for everything PCI DSS. If you've got credit card data, it's going to be in CD. What's the point? PCI DSS is an absolute pain, you know, in terms of audit and things like that. If we put all the applications with credit card data in one zone, we basically contain the pen to this one zone, and the others are much more, uh, have much more freedom in what they can do. And TNZ, for example, is the one for the GOB, so the Global Operation Bridge, which will allow us to drive everything else. So that gives the idea. Uh, and what are our findings when it comes to that? I mean, finding number one, um, the number of uh, connectivity uh, that you have in your system is actually crazy big. And for each of those connectivities, we need to have someone actually validating. Can application A talk to application B? It basically depends in which uh, zone application A and application B are, and it also depends on, is it, are they untitled? Is it a valid need? If not, it's not going to happen. Today, we've got 10,000 of those rules which are in our backlog, meaning they need to be validated to open them. And we are at the very beginning of the project, which means that the number of connectivity that you have is probably way, way, way bigger than what you think. And when you start to go zero trust architecture and think about every single connectivity to validate, is it something possible or not, you will have hundreds of thousands of them if your system is, is fairly big. And the second one is in terms of uh, investigation operating the system. Well, you've got eight zones, and it means that your people, when they investigate, I'm thinking about our frontline teams, you know, the ones that are called in terms of invest in, in case of investigation, it makes their life super difficult, okay? And I have to say that we still have to learn about that. I see a lot of learning in front of us uh, to actually figure out how we manage that and to uh, be able to operate the whole system uh, in, in, in a decent way, I mean, fast enough. Today in our data center, everything is open, that makes it easy. And this is my last slide. Um, I'd like to talk about the ways to migrate to the cloud. Because if you're engaged in such a project, the cloud providers are going to make you dream, but things are not always that simple. So we've got four ways to move our application in the cloud. 
The easiest one, the one on the right, we decommission application. Easy. Well, no, not that easy. Every single application that we really will want to decommission, you will have someone in the organization or a team raising a hand and saying, wait a minute, I need this application. I'm using it for the last 20 years. I like it very much. It does the job. I want it. So you will have to fight for everything you want to kill. It's not going to be that easy. And if you manage to kill something, uh, you still have to provide an alternative in the cloud. But this alternative is likely to be some kind of managed service, which is not going to be free. So then uh, saying, uh, I'm going to decommission application is going to be less work. We'll have a cost in terms of alternative option in the cloud and will make people unhappy in the organization. Not that easy. Next one, what we call fast track, it's actually lift and shift. The cloud provider, if they engage you, they will tell you, ah, it's easy, we'll do lift and shift for you. We take the virtual machine in your data center, lift, shift, we move it in, in, the, in the public cloud and you basically have no work. We even have automatic tooling to do that for you. I'm going to be transparent, I think it's a scam, okay? It, it doesn't work very well. It works with very, very simple cases. But if your applications are very much connected uh, between each other, it's not going to work. On top of it, when you move to the cloud, you will have to review your security. You will have to work on your application. So the number of applications where we actually did true lift and shift is crazy small. Crazy small, okay? In fact, we do clean deployment for most of them. Uh, next one is, I think, interesting. This one is a good finding. We call that big pod. The idea of big pod is to say, you've got something in a virtual machine, you don't have the time to redesign it, but you want to go in, in, in Kubernetes. You want to go in containers. Well, you know what? Do it. You take your virtual machine, you take every process in your virtual machine, you move them in containers, you put what is that in one single pod. That's the way we call it a big pod, okay? Not really nice, okay? Not super clean. Uh, no microservices in there. But frankly, it works very well. The migration is very easy, it happens very quickly, and then you are in Kubernetes. No more virtual machine, you are in a Kubernetes world, uh, and you can do your redesign and go microservices afterward. So those big pods, we were a bit worried at the beginning, is that going to work? Because they're good, they're big. And yes, it works fairly well. Is it, is it, and it's very nice in terms of migration. Is it really good uh, to leverage the cloud? No, no microservices. When you scale up, you scale up everything, even what doesn't need to scale up. When you scale down, you scale down everything. So it's a bit inefficient in terms of usage of the, of the, of the capacity, uh, but it's very efficient in terms of migration. And the last one is Amadeus Cloud Services. Uh, I mean, that basically, it's going microservices, okay? So this one is simple. It basically means you redesign your application. In our case, very little because our applications were kind of already based on microservices, but you base that on microservices, you deploy that in multiple pods, you can scale up, down, whatever needs to be scaled up and done, and it's super efficient. But we do it only for something like 5 to 10% of what we do. The idea is we do it where it really matters, when there is a question of cost or resiliency, and for the rest, well, uh, we do it with the other uh, methods, either accelerated ACS and fast track, and we will do the redesign later. And voila, on the, that being said, I'm done. Uh, I hope that uh, you got some value out of it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.